There always seem to be bank ads in the Jetway these days. HSBC spent just about $18 billion investing in fossil fuels last year, which is killing us all. RBC, Scotiabank, and TD are some of the largest fossil fuel investors in the world. All this posturing like they're ethical companies is just a PR stunt. I would recommend switching banks if you bank with any of these, because they're using your money to invest in fossil fuels. Credit unions and local banks are almost always better. Same. Lots of indigenous art at the Vancouver airport. It's fantastic to see clear signage for the rail line that runs to the airport. Right away, you can see that there are a lot of resources for transit users. Here we've got a fare explainer, trip planner, and there's even a phone you can use if you have questions. Most importantly, there are multiple self-serve fare machines where you can buy both single fares and a compass card, which is Vancouver's transit card. So we had a little mishap here. Um, I followed my partner through the fare gate accidentally, partly because I haven't taken the metro in forever, and partly because I was distracted by the fact that I was recording. So I had to go back out and then come back in to pay my fare, and while that happened, the train left and my partner was already on it, so I had to wait for the next one. Not too big a deal though, because I only had to wait 12 minutes for the next one, and it gave me a chance to take some shots at this station. Definitely still quite a car-dependent looking airport, with a lot of traffic and a sea of parking. There was a major lack of seating at every single metro station we saw in Vancouver. Vancouver's SkyTrain is a fully automated rapid transit system. It has 53 stations and 3 lines. Off we go! Front row seats. I love riding the train, though the reflection on the glass is a little unfortunate. This is what the stations are like. This station has two seats on the platform. Lots of highways. So again, you can see that almost everyone is standing because there's next to no seating in these stations. Seating and shelter at transit stations is really important, not just because it makes it more comfortable and attractive for everyone to use transit, but also because it's an important piece of accessibility infrastructure for people to be able to sit down. There were some beautiful views. On the right here, you can see a major transit station with trolley buses and also this mixed-use area which has a mall attached to a residential complex. Mixed-use zoning like this, with both residential and commercial, is essential to reducing car dependence. It puts the things that the residents need within walking distance. From here, the train went underground.
Within our first five minutes walking downtown, we saw at least three people who are almost certainly unhoused. Like every city in Canada, Vancouver has a problem with choosing to impoverish people through capitalism. If you see someone sprawled out in an uncomfortable position like this, I recommend checking up on them to make sure they're doing okay. Did we do that here? No, I'm gonna be honest, we didn't. And watching again, I regret not stopping to check on this person. We become so jaded and hardened to seeing these things that it becomes easy to just keep walking. My partner did at least check to make sure this person was breathing. These people deserve housing, community support, dignity, and respect. No More Stolen Sisters is a cry of protest against Canada's thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous people. These missing people are a symptom of the intergenerational trauma caused by Canada's genocide against Indigenous peoples. I'll put a link to a resource about this in the description. Some excellent bike infrastructure. This sign describes an initiative by the city to pedestrianize parts of this street. That's what these barriers are about. This is the street we were staying on. You can see there's a modal filter here, which is a traffic calming method to restrict the movement of cars. Hug rug is just a very Winnipeg gimmick. It's quaint. So, there's no signage to tell you that there's a bus stop or where to find it. We got back on a Sunday, and the bus we were taking normally comes every 45 minutes, which is a terrible transit frequency. Fortunately, we only have to wait about 15 minutes, which is still not amazing. Nice that there's a raised crosswalk here, one of the very few in Winnipeg. The Winnipeg airport also offers no way to purchase bus fare, which is extremely unusual. There's no fare machine, there's no vendor that sells bus fare, and so the only way to take the bus from the airport is to use cash. But keep in mind, the bus doesn't take bills, so you have to have coins. The formal method for purchasing bus fare at the Winnipeg airport is to go to the ATM, withdraw cash for a fee, go wait in line at Tim Hortons, hope they'll break your bill, and then use the coins to pay for the bus. The city piloted an electric bus program at this station. This aviation museum just opened, and this new crosswalk should definitely be a raised crosswalk, so that drivers have to slow down on this highway. passing through St. James here. I have a whole video about St. James, and I talked about how it's one of the most car-centric and pedestrian-hostile parts of the city. There's no sidewalk on this side, but there is a dirt path. The city's inability to maintain its roads is directly connected to car-centric urban design. Winnipeg spent over 15% of its budget on roads in 2021, a record-breaking amount, yet it serviced less than 2% of its roads. The city would have to spend three quarters of its budget every year, $750 million, to maintain the roads in a sustainable fashion. The reason for this is very simple. We have far, far more roads than we can afford. This is the bike path we rode on in my other video about St. James. Let's just put this scene in perspective for a second. On the right, we've got the Polo parking lot mall. On the left, there's this car dealership. There's also a parkade here. Most of these cars are unnecessarily large and tall, making them super dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists. And cars with tall hoods have been shown to cause more harm to pedestrians in a collision. There are sidewalks, which you don't see anyone walking on right now because walking around here is strongly discouraged. Everything, as far as the eye can see, is centered around cars. It doesn't have to be this way. Car Dependency. 
This is the Assiniboine River, one of the two major rivers that Winnipeg was built on, the other being the Red. You can see how the bus is forced to merge with and stop in the bike lane to pick people up. The street design here on Sherbrooke is some of the most progressive in the city. We've got mixed-use zoning, which means there's a mix of residential and commercial buildings. There's also a protected bike lane, and the businesses are usually set right next to the sidewalk rather than being behind a giant parking lot. Every time you see a cyclist riding on the sidewalk, it means the city has failed to accommodate this universally beneficial activity. From here, we just walked home on this road. The Manitoba Legislature. Oh, it feels good. And from here, we're just about home. It's about a 15 minute walk. We could have connected to another bus and gotten to a stop five minutes away, but it was a beautiful day to be out. That's it. What's it like to take transit from the airport in your town or city? Let me know in the comments. And I've got more videos about Vancouver and Winnipeg coming, so keep an eye out.